yeah, it's it's great to have you uh, today and, and have this opportunity to have this chat. I think I, I know we had a call on the phone before, but uh, now to see you on the screen, at least it's kind of the next best thing to really see you in person. So, yes, yeah, feels good. This is, my, yeah. this is the first interview I've done on Skype. I have used Skype for various things before, but it'll be, uh, yeah, yeah, it feels, uh, feels nice. Cool. So, um, really, my, the, the reason I wanted to do this interview with you and with various other practitioners is I just, I feel that um, people, ha a lot of people have the wrong idea about the specialty. And I think they go into it w believing that, you know, it's the answer to their, their problems in the NHS. And for some of them, they're looking for an easy solution. Yeah. Um, and for others, obviously, they, they do, they're interested in the in the aesthetics, but the whole business side is a whole other story, and a lot of people struggle um, to make it work. So you've obviously, you've been, become very successful over the, is it 10 years you've been running Skin Viva, is that right? Yes, uh, nearly exactly 10 years and two, three, well, four months now, yeah. And I uh, love all the things you've been doing. Um, I think we share the same ethics. So I just think it's really interesting for people out there to kind of get to know you a bit better and about your journey and how you've come you know arrived at the stage yes I'd like to share it I'm a big fan of transparency it's actually one of our company values is transparency so um, I, I love exploding myths and uh, uh, with clients and with myself so I'm, I'm happy to share everything great so um, for those people who don't know you um, at all would you mind just telling people about what your your background, where you've come from, and how do you get into aesthetics? Um, so the, I suppose there's, there's long and short versions of that. Um, the, my, my background is I'm, I'm a GP, um, but I wasn't a GP when I started. I was a foundation doctor just finishing FY2. Um, and uh, I, you know how your banding changes quite a lot. So basically, I was uh, I completely honestly, I was on the lookout for some way of stabilizing my income. It's exactly mm. what you, exactly why you are how you opened this was was the mistake I made, which is I thought, oh, I'll just do that, and then my income will be stable, because it'd be really easy, obviously. Um, I didn't realize it'd be another three years before I really started yeah. to feel like I was actually getting anywhere. But, um, uh, well, I had successes, but I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't an income that I would rely on, you know, and yeah. for a long time. So, um, so yeah, I, I started, I actually had a, a friend who uh, came around to my house, and she just dropped this a really close friend, lived with her for years at uni, like at different universities. She came to Manchester with us from uh, Warwick, where I was at medical school. Um, and she was just about to go emigrate back to Hong Kong. Um, and she she just in, into the conversation just dropped this this kind of curious line. She said, she said, well, actually, I have other sources of income. And they shouldn't say what else. And that was a really unusual thing for her to say. And I just mm. couldn't. So I said, "Come on, you know, Beatrice, tell me what's going on." And she she told me that she she had this practice um, for about a year, which she was terrified that basically other people would copy her. So there's that mm. sense of kind of this is a real. There's she and she did say there's there's going to be loads of competition and there's no you know it's really cutthroat and difficult to, to make a living and um but it but she was enjoying it and she was starting to get some success. And she told me because she was leaving, going back to Hong Kong, and um and that basically got my got, got me interested um she told me all about it you know it's really great to hear i think similar to what you're trying to do to actually hear the real journey mm. took away some of the the uncertainty that i would have had if i'd come at it without knowing anything um so i, I got quite excited um I, uh, I i did a training course i treated my first client which was way more nerve-wracking than I thought it was going to be because it was the first time of true accountability, just me by myself yeah. uh, saying that I'm fully responsible for this. Um, I remember being very nervous. Um, but then I also remember it making a good difference and seeing the person get happier in the consultation and thinking, actually, that was quite enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was probably about 18 months after that that I actually started to think maybe I could be really good at this. And it was to do with the aesthetic component. So actually realizing that I had an instinct for how to make what would actually make people look better looking um, mm. and at a slightly higher level than just copying the injection points which which off, that's obviously how you've got to start people learn injection points but then you you move into a new realm of designing basically it's more it, there's this big artistic element which I realized yeah. that I had and for yeah. me that was the real takeoff that I thought actually I could do this for a long time because it's it's both challenging rewarding um, uh, and and difficult. I like the fact that it was difficult to get 
I was never 100 percent satisfied. So there was more to more. To, I would still feel like that. There's still more to learn. There's more to get, more to improve on. And then I thought I can do that for longer. Um, mm-hmm. And then training came basically uh, as a as a result of getting a clinic and and realizing that also once again financial driver, which was that we we had we took on we found this great clinic, but we didn't have enough clients to pay for it. So we we started doing training, which worked really well. Loved that. Trained a group of my colleagues for free. Just to just to see if if what it was like. So I got four of my GP colleagues, um, yeah. and we did our first course, and they loved it. In fact, I think at least two of them are still practicing, um, and doing well for themselves from that from that as their background. And uh, and yeah, kind of went from that. Mm, so how so? When did you first start aesthetics? What year was that then? Two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Wow. Oh, sorry, early two thousand eight. So I it's think, been ten years. Yeah. And so Skin Viva came about just shortly after that. Uh, Skin Viva came about because um, drtimpierce.com, I was, you know, when you make your own website, you're very proud of it. <laughs> and you put it on your email. And then I started emailing people at work. And the next thing, basically, I, I got into uh, a lot of office politics, which I didn't want to be involved in because I literally had no clients at that point. I mean, I, had, I was probably seeing, if I was having a good month, it would have been two or three people in a month. So I was taking no time. I started a new GP job and I was really slow with my paperwork mm. and they the, somehow they connected the fact that I was slow with my paperwork, which is, was actually because I was doing, I wasn't just highlighting, I was actually coding everything myself because I, I didn't know that someone else would have done that. So I was really slow and battling and finding this really stressful. And then the person I was working for basically started having, creating this idea in her head that the reason I was slow is because I was building this this business during work hours which I I wasn't I wasn't doing anything so it came back to bite me and basically someone then then I had this meeting with my supervisor and I was like wow like this is way more complex than I thought it was going to be and I just I just wanted my name out of it um and so I I I changed to Skin Viva also out of a to get away from uh knowing from people knowing who I was I wanted to I wanted to keep them really separate but well you've put you've decided to put yourself out there I mean which is great so you know you it's very it's going to be really difficult I think for you to hide what you do and who you are now but yeah. I don't no, think you want to hide anymore because you've no, got I, nothing I to hide no I definitely don't I mean in those days it's, it's you know there are a lot of stereotypes there are a lot of um, people, people still to this day think, you know, there are many people with a negative association with aesthetics, yeah. which maybe we'll touch on, you know, that in fact I had the last time I had it was at a school reunion and someone said, uh, aren't you just making um, money out of people's insecurities? And yeah. I'm so far on in my thinking on this that it didn't, it didn't upset me at all. And it was a real moment of realizing, like, I'm, I know my philosophy now. I know what I'm about. I, I don't, I, I don't, it doesn't actually stress me out. And I actually yeah. had quite a good conversation with that guy. Um, because I could explain how you can basically how I do it, which is starting with the psychology, um, n- never uh, doing this thing which I call um, uh, pushing pu- pushing someone into a hole and selling them a ladder. I think it's very easy to to do that, um, but actually you can always start with their problem and then move them away from that rather than creating a problem and then saying this is how much it'll be to fix. So um, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. But there was um, I've definitely moved from feeling like I need to keep it separate to actually integrating aesthetics into my whole life philosophy and I'm, I'm really happy with it and yeah. you're right but nothing 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 at all to hide in fact I'm, I'm really proud of what I do so it's, it's been a big yeah. shift from from those early days I saw the recent video that you did about that comment that uh, your um, ex uh, was it uh, ex university uh, friend made the, about the insecurities um, and I, I really agree with what you say like your approach is it's pretty much how I approach it, uh, apart from the only slight difference is I do a lot more skin rejuvenation. So I, that's where I would start. And then the injectables will come a bit later. But definitely it's about getting to know the client. Um, so I like to refer to them as clients because I do a lot of skin treatment and they don't like to be called patients. So I just mm. so that's that's kind of this client patient debate. Um, I, I just decide to call them clients. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's about finding out where they are now and where they want to get to, really. And my job is to show them how to get there. So it's never about pushing them into, into a hole and then giving them a ladder to climb out. It should never be like that. Yeah. I, the way I have come to frame it in my own mind is that um, they are the hero. I'm I'm the I'm the expert guide. So I need to make them the hero in their own story for, for in order for me to be 
successful in my role as an expert guide, um, which is really different to a lot of people think that they need to be the hero. So I need to come in and tell you what's wrong with your life in order for me to be the hero. Whereas actually, you, you're never an expert on their life. You're only an expert on faces and you can use that skill to make them the hero. Yeah. Um, for me, that, that phrasing just made it really clear in my mind about what yeah. I had to do. I think that's a great philosophy. And I, I think um, from talking to lots of aesthetic practitioners in sort of various um, places in their, in their journey, a lot of them have struggled with combining aesthetics with the NHS job. And a lot of them find they have to, they feel like they have to hide what they do from their colleagues, from their family, from friends. I mean, there are some who have got really supportive friends and family and they're really lucky. Um, but how, you know, what, what advice would you give those people who feel like they can't tell people what they do because they feel ashamed of it almost? Um, I think you've, you've, got to, you've got to search internally um, to actually sort your own philosophy out because I, I found myself in the beginning quite conflicted with other people's messages. So I remember, I actually remember a drug rep saying, you know, if you really want to be good at this, you should be using two mils with every practitioner, with every person that you, every patient that you see. Okay. And, um, and th that really jarred with me because it was not, it's nothing, there's nothing like that in the NHS where if you really want to be good at this, you should be prescribing citalopram to every other patient or, you know, there's no yeah. goal like that. So, um, but I thought, you know, in those early days unformed that I had to kind of mold myself to this different mold. And I was trying to pick up like what, what is the correct way to do this? and various people influence you. And the, the big change for me was when I scrapped all of that and I just started to just make it the way I wanted it to be. Um, and then once I'd internalized that, because the other thing is everyone wants to help people. You'll hear a lot of people say, I want to help people and make them feel good. But until you actually feel that, until you actually see it happening and you see people's lives change, it doesn't necessarily feel real yet. Mm. So, and the way I the way I always suggest to get around that with people is to always start by finding their story. So you find out, not their presenting complaint, but what's their story? And the story is always vastly more interesting than the presenting complaint. I mean, as you know, often the presentation is, I want three areas of Botox. Well, that's not a story. That's not even a presenting complaint. It's a, it's a, it's a treatment plan. So um, you've got to take them back. And then you start to get really interesting stuff back, you know, and you can almost never predict how, how deep and interesting it is. You know, um, some, some of them are patterns. Like I, I do hear one of the things I heard last week again um, is a sort of postmenopausal woman who who says she feels like she's disappearing, and that makes me feel really sad. Like mm -hmm. that, that's a quite a common experience that you're used to, and um, you're used to being noticed, or and then suddenly you start to feel like there's something that changes physically that you start to fade into the background. So that for me is a whole different story from I want three areas of Botox. Um, but there are even more interesting ones which I could I could go on about for ages about people's relationship with their parents and loving themselves. A lot of people have treatments at the point where they learn to love themselves, which is a total opposite of what what most people think. They think that you're going there because you don't love yourself. But actually I've got several dozen patients I can think of where it's, this is one of what I do to make myself feel like I'm nurturing myself and mm -hmm. the rest of my life I'm giving. If I can, if I nurture myself in this way, I'm, be I'm a better mum, I'm a better husband, you know, wife, husband, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, but you never, you don't get to find that out unless you do these questions at the beginning around trying to find out what their mm -hmm. story is. Because you can find their story, you can help them then improve their story. It's empowering for them. You mm. get to see the result. They tell you about it in four months' time, and it's amazing. And then suddenly all the fear and shame that you might have because people think it's mm. a superficial thing that doesn't matter and that is a, you know, you're selling out on your, all your doctory skills or nursing skills or whatever it, uh, your profession is in the background, all of that starts to fade because you realize there's huge value in what you're doing. And I get the same sense of value. I still do GP work. It's this. I don't feel any different in terms of the value I'm generating. Mm. It's really similar. For a, I mean, it's, it's like the same in GP. A lot of the stuff you work, you do, isn't life changing. But you know, one in ten patients, you get massive reward from. It feels really similar in aesthetics. In fact, probably higher because I get to talk to them for longer. Mm. You know what? Sometimes I feel like the the aesthetics work that I do is, I feel like I'm making even bigger difference than I did in in medicine because. Um, because like you, I do spend a lot of time with my, my clients talking to them. It's a lot of it is almost like talking therapy. And actually, if, if I can help them change their, their um, mindset and the way they think about their lives themselves, there's this whole shift in their confidence. Even though I haven't made such dramatic changes to how they look, 
but how they feel about themselves is completely different and that it, it transforms lives it really does and I think um, for, for those practitioners who are quite new and haven't quite experienced it, they, they, they probably just think, oh, I'm being really dramatic. But it really does transform lives. Yeah. I was going to say, do you think that people are training in the wrong order? They're learning things in the wrong order. Um, I mean, I feel six years ago when I first went into aesthetics, I just went on a foundation course for Botox and fillers. You know, one day for Botox, one day for fillers. And then that was it off I went, uh, I had to start getting uh, patients to come and they, at, back then there was no mention of psychology um, and I wasn't even taught about high lays. Um I think they, we just, they just glossed over vascular occlusions so yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know and it was only later when I found that out I was like oh my god <laughs> you know this is really risky um, so it, it's really scary. Um, I, I mean do you think that in the I, I don't know about skin viva training but do you cover a lot of psychology and kind of how practitioners should should approach different situations uh yeah it's the opening page of my manual is is yeah. a story about the patient who taught me about psychology which was uh, and actually the oldest patient i think i've ever had she's 90 in her 90s and she um her story was that she wanted one area of Botox and I'm here, this new practitioner, thinking, what am I going to do for someone in their 90s, like to make them look younger? Because I thought that's what my job was. Um, and her, the conversation with her was, I just want to be more approachable on the bus. I feel like I'm scowling. And I was like, wow. So it's actually, it's like a, so this is about her interacting with society and she's, mm. she wants to engage more and connect more with people on her day to day life. And I was like, well, that's totally different. She doesn't want to look 91. You know, she, she just wants to look approachable she doesn't care which yeah. how she looks so that was and that's the front page of my of my of our foundation manual um, but I was the same for you I'm, I'm sad that even six years ago it hadn't shifted so me ten years ago I still have the the original training and it's one bullet point on one slide about the uh, necrosis and no mention of high layers so yeah. there's tons of people out there so yeah ours my manual is full of horrific pictures to scare people there's a whole like four pages of awful um, stuff because I because I know that if you don't see it, it doesn't mean anything to you. You need, you need to vi have that almost animalistic response of, wow, I really don't want that to happen. And some people arrive a bit scared on the first day, but we, we teach them about it, so hopefully they're, they're back in control of it. Yeah. I, I think people definitely need to have a, uh, a healthy level of fear. That's how I, I like to phrase it. I think for those who are not scared anymore, I think that's quite dangerous. I think we should always be a little bit afraid. Um, because these things it could happen to the best of us I think it's a really interesting point and something that I um, recently have been because we, we you're on our mindset group I think as well um, yeah. that I, I want to get away from any messaging that says that you shouldn't feel unpleasant emotions I, I think that you must you just have to you shouldn't get stuck in a cycle of unpleasant emotions so it's the difference between fear and anxiety is exactly that if having fear is fine because it tells you to do something to get away from the danger mm. then you're in control of it having anxiety is when it goes around in a loop and you're, you're not actually doing anything with the fear mm. so I 100% agree I still feel scared on a daily basis and I don't want to ever not have that because when I'm scared I'm focused you know I'm thinking carefully I do things more mindfully mm. I don't just you, know, you don't just slap it in you know you really are thinking about every tiny little step so 100% agree I think is a good point yeah um I, so you you recently went to uh, you had an interview with um, Professor David Sines for yeah. uh, regarding the JCCP. I mean, without you know getting to review too much uh, secrets because I know you're producing a video uh, or the interview. Um, did you find out anything new that you didn't know before? Um, I think uh, I'd say without giving because we're going to hopefully start releasing some of that this week. But it, without. Um, mm without giving away all the all the details the the biggest thing is i mean i really feel like the perception out there of it it's almost like you're talking about north korea the way people talk about it like it's um it's really like it's so extreme in terms of the how you know the just sort of donald trump language of like the hated jccp and when you actually meet yeah. them incredibly reasonable no kind of crazy like non-logical ideas yeah. everything has a really clear sequence of events behind it um and and actually, the biggest surprise of all is is the amount of agreements that I got, particularly on pushing with a non-medic issue. Um, 
Uh, I'll I'll give you one really interesting fact, which kind of which I think is probably one of the more interesting ones, which is that um, there there have been no non medics even apply. There's quite a lot of medics who are applying, uh, and this fact alone is obviously going to change the whole the whole dynamic of the organisation. Um, so uh, for me, that was very interesting because I thought it might. I was actually fearful it would be the other way around that because of this resistance amongst yeah. medics that it would be it would become a beauty therapist or a non-medic because not, it's not just beauty therapists but it become a non-medics organization and actually it's completely different mm. and one of the reasons for that is because there are actually no level seven courses currently that train beauty therapists that are approved there are lots who are saying that they are but there are none on their register who, who are who are even a, able to apply so this idea of the floodgates opening is just not true when you look at the actual facts yeah. so, um, I think it's a it's a classic case of fear of the unknown because yep people don't know what it's going to be like um, and it's just another organization and it's another one that potentially we have to pay uh, a fee a membership fee for um, and there seem to be lots of these organizations popping up I mean do you think people are, lots of people are just jumping on the bandwagon trying to <laughs> you know <laughs> do something I, I there's so many organizations out there i mean i, I think if anything we should we should be trying to unifying it and not you know splitting ourselves apart what are your views on this yeah i i mean i i 100 agree for, for me uh, well one of it's kind of like a life life philosophy that anything that that comes about purely through fear tends not to be a great a great thing so what i mean by fear is anything that's that's purely about excluding people um, you know, purely about getting away from some danger and isn't about trying to create something more beautiful in the future is is probably going to have flaws in it. Um, so I, I see that with 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 some of the organisations. I, I think others are more unified around actually trying to create a different future. You know, um, and I do think the JCCP is that, and I think Safe Face is that. Um, so there, there is, but yeah. So I mean, I do. What what the problem, as you say, is that there's now which one do I choose and which one, um, and I, you know I, I'm not in a position necessary where I can be 100% concrete on that um, mm. which one you should choose. But I agree with the principle. I think for me a guiding light is, um, and I ask this question all the time. It's it's what what is the best possible outcome you could achieve, and and what how should you strategically be placing your business? And if you want to know that, it's always about patience. So what is the best thing you could do for patience? Um, if you can. If you can create a system in the future that will make things better for, for patients, and if you're part of that process, if you're actually one of the people who build that future, you're going to do well in that future because you've built something that's valuable to the to the people who who build who pay for our, our industry. Mm. So build something valuable for patients, and you'll be fine. Um, do spend a lot of time doing things that isn't necessarily 100% focused on patients, and you're basically probably falling behind the people who are doing that. Um, and, and ultimately, I love that. It's the beautiful symmetry in life, which is if you focus on the needs of other people, um, you're going to be fine. And, and I, that's what I'd encourage Absolutely. people to do. Yeah. Um, so you recently started a Facebook group, group called The Future of uh, Medical Aesthetics. I mean, what do you what would you like the future of medical aesthetics to be, let's say, in five years time? Um, five years might be too soon, but um, <laughs> I'm in this. Well, whole... a lot can happen in five years. Yes, you're right. Um, so uh, I think that the big, what I would love, there's, there's kind of two aspects to it. The, the first thing that should happen is that your mom or my mom or my dad or anyone could book in, walk into any clinic in the country and get, a re, get firstly the thing we've already talked about, which is a person-centered, not a, mm. not a face-centered consultation, um, and that they will be treated by someone who has been validated to a, to a a level of safety that we that you should expect in a first world country and that that person is fully prepared to 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 look after complications and keep that person safe so it's a it's treatments done for the right reason in a safe way um so that any member of the public doesn't have to spend hours researching who's doing what a bit more like it is to, to see a gp or a dentist you know we don't i don't feel massive anxiety going to any dentist who opened up around here, I expect them to be of a certain level. You know, mm. same for a doctor. Like, why? Why? It's not like that with medical aesthetics. It's actually terrifying if you think about it. And it's not even. You don't even have to go through the front door. You can just watch Instagram and see what how people are injecting, and oh. it's, it's it's really terrifying. And that's, um, 
and then you see picture. I mean, the other thing that isn't actually out in the open is how bad it is because people blame themselves. So people go and see see someone who isn't who isn't very good at what they do because they don't know how to tell what's good or not. They get sometimes a really awful. Like I've seen uh, someone with a, showing me pictures of her friend's lip necrosis who hasn't told anyone because she blames herself. So they make a mistake. They blame themselves and they and they don't share their story. Yeah. And that's happening all over the all over the place. So um, yeah, if I would say if I could contribute to one idea would be that idea that that in in five years time anyone can walk in and, and have a treatment anywhere and and expect a certain level now um that that's the very high level goal um i i think that would be it the, the other thing which um which we're quite keen on is that and i know you are as well is to is to is to decrease some of the negative stuff that happens mm. between other, other professionals i know i really feel like we should we should be unifying we should be supporting each other and this is exactly yeah. what you're doing on, on your group and what we do on our groups is, is actually try and try and try and change the what is the normal way of interacting with yeah. your colleagues in this field and make it more positive and supportive and less fearless because it all it comes from insecurity and fear in my opinion i think the the problem is that medical aesthetics it, people don't treat it as a, a specialty in its own right people just think of it as the the thing on the side I think in my ideal world medical aesthetics should be treated as a specialty in its own right and I think people who enter it no matter what background they have they should still have to go through a standardized training process and learn all the different aspects of aesthetics um, and to me aesthetics includes from anything from skin care topical skin care to skin rejuvenation procedures to injectables and even energy-based devices which I don't do at the moment but I'd love to learn more about because I think unless you have this you know understand everything that's available you know how can you advise patients what the most appropriate uh, options are because a lot of the time you can't treat their problems with injectables and I think that's a problem with someone who have just done a Botox and filler course they're trying to treat everything with Botox and fillers, and that's where they, they can get a lot of problems. I mean, do you yeah. currently do any skin treatments at all? Uh, we, do a f we do some topicals um, and a few procedural things like microneedling. Um, I used to have a CO2 laser, but I got rid of it, basically. So, um, so I, have a, I have a kind of a foundation knowledge in it, but we are mainly injectables. Mm. Um, but the but you're you're 100 percent correct in that you should be giving the spectrum of advice that's required and and I I, I really 100 like really feel that problem with trying to solve things with injectables. I mean mm. obviously it's not something that carries on for long because it's very disappointing if you try and solve the wrong problem uh, with injectables. So I but but I I do agree with that philosophically that you you should be giving as much advice as possible. Mm. The same also applies to surgery that you've got to if you you need to. Put some time into learning about the surgical options so that you know which point you're, you're straying into territory that you can't deliver on um, because surgical surgery is the right option um, but it, do, it does grow and grow and I, I think even within injectables there's a problem which is and I actually had a patient a few years ago as a really classic example you know the intermediately trained injecto solves all problems with cheek nasolabial lips and marionette lines um, but that's but that's the other problem which is at what point do you differentiate yourself um do, do you start to add in because what i also see practitioners do is foundation botox skin needling skin skin creams you know um and they're doing everything to a five out of ten standard yeah. so that and it's hard i mean i'm I, you know it I, we all have to go through that point of being five out of ten but don't what i think is a bit sad is the i now do 150 different treatments yeah and none of them really well like you've got to You've, you've got to get to, you know, I don't know how to score it, but at least a 7 out of 10 in each thing uh, rather than 3 or 4 out of 10 in lots yeah. of things. Because, and I know this from, from our business. It's incredibly hard to integrate a new, a new treatment into your, into your clinic. It depends on how single-handed you are. But as soon as you have even someone who answers the phone, they need to be trained how to answer the questions for the new thing. You need to put on your website. You need to, you know, be SEO'd for those terms. You need to start producing content around it. And if you if you produce if you do a hundred different things you you're not going to be marketing and the whole process has to be integrated so it's very very hard mm. to do anything regularly um, unless you unless you you know you ha you have to be incredibly organised and um, 
what's the word I was going to use that um, I would describe you this way as well, which is consistency. Like I can see, I've, I said it to you in a message that I can tell who's going to be, who's going to do well because of this, of that sense of consistency. They just keep going. There's no like here, here today and gone tomorrow. There's, mm. I, I think that's a superpower. That's it's a really unsexy superpower. Just being consistent. <laughs> And, and if you're going to do lots of treatments, you need to consistently offer and talk about each one. Yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, the way I look at it, I mean, it may be slightly different from, uh, well, I know that it's very different from how most people look at it, is I don't try to sell the treatments. What I do sell is my my consultation, my advice, and what I do during that consultation is after I found out everything about that client, I would then put together a personalized treatment plan for them that's, that will give them as close to the result that they want as I feel I can achieve for them. And it has to be something that, that I discuss with them, that they're happy with that. So it's because a lot of, um, I think in the past, even now, a lot of clients or patients come to see you and they ask for three area Botox or they ask for cheek filler or whatever. Or they say, you know, they think a lot of them think that um, Botox treats wrinkles and then they'll say, I'm really unhappy about these lines there. I need some Botox there. You know, I hear this so much. So a lot of what we do actually is educating them. And yeah. if you just, you know, if we just explain to to the, the patients about these treatments, how they work and, and why do we use it in the areas that we do, um, then actually they'll quickly realize that the treatment that they ask for is not going to give them the result that they want. So it's all part of the managing expectations, educating. Um, so this is why I think, um, you know, you need to spend at least half an hour per session with a with the, with the patient to explain all this stuff. So there are some clinics, it's ridiculous, they have like 10 minute appointments or 15 minute slots and it's literally in and out like a conveyor belt. Um, and I think that's really wrong. And even if the doctor is really, or the, even if the practitioner is really experienced, it is not fair for the patients, um, they they are paying too much for a fifteen minute slot. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I think it's a uh, it's this patient. Uh, we call it the the vending machine approach, which is there there isn't really a consultation. The consultation is is more around is it is it safe to inject you? Do you want it? Let's yeah. do it. Um, and the the safe bit isn't always included either. But. The, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it's the yeah that that element of expert guidance. Is, is is absent so i and i 100 percent and you're exactly right i think your your strategy for your clinic that, that, that's perfect because no one can replicate that except you once they bought into the idea that you're an expert who can provide them with what they need um how do you you can't copy that you know you can copy prices you can copy products mm. but if you if you're putting yourself like i'm the product and actually i will then advise you what to do to solve your problem that's perfect yeah, and I, I think it's. I'm surprised actually not more people take this approach because this is what this is what keeps my clients. They keep coming back to me, um, mm. and I get to know them really well. And I can I can charge the prices that I charge, and um, and I can afford not to take on you know hundreds of clients. I'll just have a few hand a uh, handful of really good clients, um, and I know that they will keep coming back. And they're not having injectables each time. They you know they could be having a different treatment each time. And then they're really happy and I get to know them like they, they become friends and it's really nice. And that's what I really enjoy about aesthetics. And yeah. I think this is what more and more people should do. And certainly when I teach people, this is the approach that I teach them. Um, and I think if more and more practitioners take this approach, then your vision of what things will be like in five years will get closer to that. Yeah. And, and, and I, I 100% agree, and I think there's two ways that that'll happen. I mean, it, it'll happen because we'll, you'll suffocate the bad practitioners because everyone will start to get an idea that that, that shouldn't have been that quick or that easy or there should have been more, mm. um, or at least that those practitioners will struggle because they'll be dealing with people who are less loyal, who flit about, who are very more, much more about price consciousness than about quality. Mm. Um, so there's that that's the you know if there's no regulation there's still a way to exert a force to upwards which is exactly exactly what you're saying mm. that, that and i think that's perfect and that but it comes from asking yourself a, a different question so um in terms of if you think about it, that was all that was kind of lovely what you said but at the same time it's a business strategy um 
and uh, and I I think you can appeal to people who are interested in who think both ways. You can. This is also a really good business strategy because because of all those things that you're building trust. Like the, the outcome, I would say the number, what the highest outcome I think you can achieve in a consultation is to build a bridge of trust. It's not about getting a treatment done or or you know selling four thousand pounds worth of stuff. Like that's really that's actually that's not a great outcome. The greatest outcome you can have is that they think. That was amazing. They understood me. They gave me excellent advice. Um, they told me not to have this treatment, even though I thought that was what that was what I needed. Mm. Um, and I'm going to go away and think about it. But I know that that's the practitioner mm. I'm going to come back to. So you, I, absolutely, that's what you're doing. You're building trust ahead yeah. of uh, providing treatments, which is what all medical people should do. And the thing is, this is a slow game. But I've had several people that I've had a consultation with, um, they've left, left without having any treatments or, or they didn't book in any treatments. But then a few weeks or a couple of months down the line, I hear from someone who said, oh, so and so told me about you. They were really impressed and uh, I've come for some, you know, I want some treatments. So it, every, I, every single person I speak to, I see that as an opportunity for me to sell myself and my services. It's not about selling the treatments. <clears throat> is about selling a service and I think this is what people you know if, if people want to have a long-term successful business in aesthetics they need to start thinking about it as a service that they're providing it's not just it's, you're not selling syringes filler you're not selling vials of, of Botox you know any technician can do that but the value that we add which is why we can justify the prices that we charge is is the our experience and the advice that we can give yeah, I hundred percent agree. Um, I, it's a, actually a saying of mine. I've said to myself, and I don't know how many meetings, um, when you know these decisions come up in your business, and it's it's uh, I'm growing an oak tree, not weed, um, and it and you always taking that long term view of, and I, and I'm committed now. I'm going to be involved in this industry the rest of my life. I'm pretty sure. So that changes everything when you think in those long term uh, ways, and I've, you see it as well that this is what a new practitioner won't get. I remember doing a, a consultation with one of my clients who's still a client now. We're 10 years on. Consultation, 18 months went by. I didn't hear from her again. Uh, and then she came back and booked in because she'd been around two or three other places. And she said I was the only one, basically the only one that I, that had built a bridge of trust. Mm. Um, so, she, so she came back for that reason. You, and that's what all of our clients all the time, even though they will they make you feel like sometimes they make you feel like it's only about the money. And I certainly had this in, in the early days much more mm -hmm. because I'd ask how much is on the phone and they say, I can get it cheaper. They'd have a consultation and they'd come back that uh, even if they found somewhere cheaper, sometimes they still come back because yeah. you are basically yeah. meeting more of their, of their yeah. important needs. Money is only one of our needs. It's not everything. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned that you're still doing some GP shifts. Yeah. And is that your plan to just continue doing that in the background or will you at some point come out of that as well? Well, I, I do. As I say, it's, uh, there, there are more the needs than um, money and growing a business and, uh, and aesthetics. I just, it's part of my identity being a GP. I, I don't, I always ask myself because I have to say stress is higher on those days. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily leave with a smile on my face every day, but I get a, I get something out, else out of it. Mm. Um, some of it's identity, some of it's the challenge. Um, uh, you know, I, I just, I just like that. I, I can't let go of it for some reason. So I, I could have let go of it even six years ago would have been fine. Mm. Um, but, uh, I, I can't for some reason. I'm not saying I never will. And I, but I have no plan to leave at the moment. Mm. Well, I think that's different for everyone, isn't it? Because there are some people who have just had enough with the NHS and they want to, they want to leave and they, that, that's, probably, that's why they go into aesthetics. Mm. Um, and then they're hit with the surprise that, you know, it does take time to build it up and then it's all quite disappointing. And I've come across so many people who have, you know, done the course of maybe a few years ago and just kind of um, dabbled in it and haven't really done much with it. And it was just a shame because I think a lot of those people, I, I find that, pe that the practitioners who are conscientious, who want to do well, they end up not doing anything with it because they're just so scared of the complications. And there's all, uh, you know, a lot of the ones who don't care as much or have more business skills and they just, you know, want to make money. Um, and they, they tend to sort of excel in the in the business world um, and they tend to become more successful. Um, and I just I don't think it should be like that. I think it's really unfair. Yeah, um, I mean, I certainly agree with you that there's a there's a there's a problem with the 
the perception and as we still have people book onto training courses you know often uh, the, the one that you have to hold yourself back they say things like i was thinking about retiring early so i thought i'd do an aesthetics course I was like no <laughs> don't retire yet <laughs> Like the, as if you know, a year after starting, you're suddenly going to have enough money that you can retire early. It just, it just isn't. It just isn't that. Um, so yeah, and and I, but I also I hundred percent agree with you that there's something sort of ironic about the fact that the better people almost sell themselves out of it because yeah. because they um, because they worry too much. And I I will say that to people is that you. You, you, the fact that you worry, it could actually become one of the one of the reasons why you succeed if you stick at it, because you'll be you'll be a more trustworthy practitioner yeah. than than someone who doesn't care about it. Um, uh, and then you, there are people who have all of it. You know, I, I do. I have met people who've come through our courses and excelled rapidly, but have have that worry as well. They just have the drive and the worry, yeah. um, you know, and the business acumen and the fearlessness. Because putting yourself out on social media is not easy. A lot of people really struggle with that videos in particular um so there's there are a lot but i tell you what it's the greatest experience of your life if you get through it because you become a different person and that you're proud of once you've gone over all those hurdles yeah. um and you know you're never over it you're always going on to doing to doing new things but if you can the, the thing with the nhs which is i can't imagine myself being a normal gp i mean maybe i would have found something else to do within it but it's uh it just feels claustrophobic doing mm. doing you know eight sessions a day of that instead of there's so many, just like this video is another opportunity um, that, that you know, is making me think differently and reflect differently and, uh, and contribute. Hopefully other people watch this and learn from it. Um, you know, that's, that's amazing. And there's, there, there's very few, I didn't see any clear paths to do that in the NHS. Um, and uh, that's, if you can stick at it beyond two or three years and put yourself out there, um, you, you start to do that. And, you, and I can see people who've done it. Um, who've trained with us who are, who are moving into that sphere of starting to really enjoy it mm. but it's usually minimum of a year into it you know mm. that and, and even then I know because you get the messages you know the, the worry the anxiety that is it a complication mm. that doesn't go away for a long time because it actually because there's so few of them mm. so you, you don't get that loads of loads of experience so do you think that the people who've gone through your training courses and are succeeding do you think it's it's partly also due to the the um, support the ongoing support that you provide as a training academy um, well I, I can definitely take credit for some of it because um, because because they tell us mm -hmm. like if I was about to stop when this happened I mean particularly with our mindset group there are a lot of people who are making big inroads because so much of it is your psychology and the, and the meaning you have behind what's holding you back um, so that's helping a lot um, I mean, we do give a lot of practical training, but I still, th I've got to say the biggest, because you and I are the same, you know, we did a course that wasn't that great and we still carried on. Mm -hmm. Like there's something, um, there's something about, about having enough bravery to, 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 to carry on while not being um, careless. And there's a balance, there's a balance point. And I certainly, I was one of those practitioners who sweated. I mean, in fact, it's on my, it's on my w website. I remember looking at my gloves and, and seeing the sweat and being, this is, this is terrifying. Why is it so scary? <laughs> but um, when I was already doing like scary stuff in A and E and stuff like that, but but that fear drove me to get better. You know, I I got back I got back home and I didn't just count the money. I went and Googled to look for for look for you know complications and learn about it. And mm -hmm. and you know the day when you do Google it and you find out, which was quite early on, but it was yeah it was a real big shock because I didn't yeah. wasn't part of my consciousness at that point. Yeah. Um, uh, so so if you've got both that drive. And and you're careful. You're going to be great. Um, but one without the other is uh, you don't you don't get a good outcome. Yeah, I think it's really great for people out there to hear that you because I think your um, your name within aesthetics is becoming bigger and bigger, and you're very well respected. And it, it's very useful for for them to hear that you have these moments as well that you're nervous. You know, even when you're so so experienced and have been doing it for a long time, that you're still a little bit nervous when you do these procedures. Um, you know, hopefully yeah. that will help. Yeah, I mean, I, I just it's, it's slightly different to nervousness. Like I'm, I'm no longer sweating when I do procedures, um, but I have I have a, an element of fear. There's it's a bit like walking along a tightrope. You know, you, you, by the time you've done it a lot, you you don't feel you're not shaking. It's not that kind of nerves, but it's but there's a there's a healthy respect you know, you know the consequences mm. they're vivid and you're in the moment being careful of it so yeah but it, but it's not i wouldn't describe it as a pleasant feeling you know it's mm. not <laughs> so um 
but it does make you safe. I don't I don't hide from that feeling. I don't want to get away from it. I'm happy. It makes me feel in control actually, having that sense of yeah. focus. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, uh, I think everyone should should hang on to that. So, yeah. And also, I think you're very lucky that Miranda is so supportive and you're in it together and you've got two lovely kids. And how do you juggle it all? It's, I'll be 100% honest, it's incredibly hard and we're getting much better at it. Um, we, when the business was in its early days, we had, we had kids and they used, to, they used to, Miranda actually used to come to work with the kids and try and, try and do work while she, while she looked after the kids. And it was next, sometimes next door to me and we'd hear the baby yeah. crying. I mean, you... People don't think that when they see the clinic because it's, it's a really nice, smart building. But we were we're still really killing it, working ridiculously long hours in order to keep it going. Um, and it was incredibly hard. So I, I wouldn't say like I didn't figure out the formula until I'd been hurt quite badly. Like it was it was very stressful. We used to take the kids. I just remember the screaming there and back in the car and the and it was it was overwhelming um, at various points. So we we've had to learn. We've had to learn how to do it better. Um, it's uh, so the, I mean I do all sorts of things to protect my mental health now which I remember being asked as a junior doctor and, and coming up with a really rubbish re- response you know it's like um, <laughs> basically it's hard it's you the, my 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 um, my focus at the moment I said the, the number one focus of your day should be your mindset um, so what are you doing each day to put yourself in a sense of um, control and mental health wise um, and you know we do various things which are actually quite funny um but one one of, I, one of the things i do every single day is run yeah. so um that makes a huge difference i feel like the stressful thoughts i have um it's almost like you have a little shield on when when i've exercised a lot and i don't know what it is that does that but that definitely helps um being good at switching roles is very important because i one of the things that was a huge stress for me is trying to do work while kids are screaming you just had this something similar tonight and i've, I've had something similar <laughs> Um, I consciously switch roles, so I'm not. I'm no. I'm no longer Dr. Tim, the aesthetic doctor. Now I'm Dad, because if you, because I found for me one of the most stressful things is trying is having your mind in two places. Mm. So you're thinking, I need to do that work, but I've got I've got this this child here who needs me, and he's screaming, and he's you know he's poured cornflakes all over the floor or or whatever it is. Uh, I have to I have to just switch and just do one or the other because I found that that was a really stressful thing. Um, having your wife do work with you is sometimes hugely advantageous uh, but sometimes it, it isn't because we bring work home we talk about it when we shouldn't mm. um we you know if something bad stressful is going on in the business usually like staff related things that, that can be quite that can be quite difficult on, on us at home mm. um but we're very interested in, in how to how to this is where the mindset group comes in we're interested in how to approach your problems without without them basically triggering triggering anxiety or not depression so much as de- depressive thoughts you know that sense of powerlessness or a danger with that you can't do anything about mm-hmm. those are the things that really mess up your head so and they're never almost never true if you can dismantle the problem and the meanings behind it and then you can you can actually resolve it so i would say it's a full-time occupation almost underneath it all trying to learn how to deal with all the all the stress and the requests and the and kids and but um but it's yeah it's also it's great being able to share it with people too but it's it's hard work yeah it would be boring otherwise wouldn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I actually think it, yeah, it would, but but also, all the big problems that that we've solved have been almost the, the worst points become your best points eventually. It doesn't feel like that, but if you yeah. if you if you tackle it well, you get something out of it. In the end, it might be two years later that you think, well, I'm actually, if that hadn't happened, all this other good stuff wouldn't have happened. So, um, uh, yeah, it's it. I always try to remember that when I'm hitting another low point, but it's a uh, but as a general rule, it seems to come true. I think for me, I mean, my daughter is coming up to five now and she has really changed how I felt about aesthetics. Um, so I just think, you know, one day she's going to be 18 and what if she goes to some practitioner requesting to have all these fillers and they just inject her with what she asked for? Mm. Uh, that, that horrifies me. So she is now my main driving force. I mean, Obviously, I think she's perfect the way she is. I don't think she needs anything done. But I would hope that if one day she does feel like she needs something done, she can speak to someone who's who can look at her as a whole person and, and not just do what she asks. Mm. It, yeah. Um, I, and I 100% agree. That's one of the things you get from being a parent that you 
is that you ha- you stop you can't be selfish anymore because you start to see the world the thing you're doing is creating something your kids are going to grow up in and mm-hmm. even if it's not aesthetics they're also going to I, I, for a while, I used to have a picture of my kids while I was doing a video in front of me because I, that would motivate me um, in a way that it's a non-selfish way. I wanted them to watch it one day and be be proud. Mm. So, um, but it's the same as what you're saying. You, you're also wanting to contribute to make something that will make your daughter safe if she doesn't have a treatment somewhere. And, and that is a really good way of getting your getting your strategy lined out and, and knowing what's important to you. Yeah. So I really agree. I think it's a good way to do it. And I particularly think it's difficult. It's more difficult with daughters because the, there is this extra um, pressure on women. And I've always been fearful of, you know, how do, how do you facilitate the need without creating the need? Is quite um, uh, is it's quite important. I think when you have it, when you have children, you can imagine you want them to feel good enough, regardless of what they look like. Yeah. You know, um, but at the same time, if there's something holding them back, there should be something that will help them. To solve that problem, but it's not. Yeah, it's it's that difficult line of not not creating the problem. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, all those girls that that come to us, they're someone else's daughter, and the parents probably feel like they don't need anything either, um, or not everyone, but generally. So yeah, it's it's really um, it's a difficult thing to balance, and I think it, it takes experience. Um, I I know, I remember when I first started doing it, I. I wouldn't, I didn't even think about, ask, you know, thinking whether this is appropriate or not. It was just, just focusing on the, on the actual procedure. It was hard enough. Um, but I think with experience, then you start to think deeper um, and start yeah. to think, be able to assess whether this is actually necessary or not. Yeah. And, but, but I think the same happens the other way as well, which is some people dismiss young people from having treatments because they're younger and they've got good skin or whatever, and they, and they almost dismiss it. And one of the things that always struck home with me as a junior doctor was when I discovered this connection between people with acne and suicide. Mm. Um, and and many, many people, many older people would look at a teenager with spots and think, you know, they would dismiss it. They wouldn't think that that's such a big, important thing. But actually, it's for some people, it's one of the contributors to, to wanting to end your life, which is insane. Yeah. Um, but it's but it's so so. It's at the same time not not capitalizing on insecurities that are going to pass within. You know, sometimes you know, if you're 16, the way you feel about the size of your lips might change in in eight months. You know, because something else changes. You know, like it's not. That your your identity is forming, you know. It's that's one of the reasons I think young people shouldn't be treated, even if they can consent properly. Is that, you know, what what risks are you taking for a fleeting um, feeling that might be gone when the girl who set the example, you know, falls out of favor or whatever? Um, so, it's um, it's it's just important not to not not to dismiss on either end of the spectrum. Yeah. It's either that you're. You're, you're only 21, so you don't need anything is also not good, it's just as it's not good to say um, to treat everyone who's 21 because they've come and asked you for it. Everyone needs to be treated and understood as deeply as possible um, so that you can empower them in a healthy way to yeah. achieve well-being. If your goal, this is actually what I actually say in my consultation, my goal is your well-being. And if you if you make that your goal, that also changes, it changes how you think about it because my goal is not necessary to serve your request mm. because you're your request may not improve your well-being and I'm always looking for that equation and, and often it's not the case mm. you know if your your goal is to have the biggest lips in town so that people finally notice you like it's not necessarily going to make you make you improve your well-being like it's it could you might be bullied because of it um so mm. you know that that equation helps me a lot say no to people mm. it's, it's similarly if they're if they're too nervous and they're never quite happy they're kind of slight there's always a borderline with dysmorphia but they're not whatever you do is not quite making them happy and they stress over it. it's not quite right like that's a it's not improving your well-being and i can't keep going because i've never seen any evidence that these treatments are making you happier um it's a good it's a really good way of saying no to people because it's out it's not it's not your it's 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 outside of your relationship mm. almost it's a it's a judgment on on your happiness and that's um someone with Someone with body dysmorphia uh, or traits of it, I mean, they can be really difficult to manage, can't they? And for, and, and these people are very um, kind of, you see them more, a lot more within the aesthetic setting compared to the general population. And I think even within, uh, amongst aesthetic practitioners, there's quite a high uh, prevalence of BBD. 
So I particularly have noticed during when I was doing uh, mentoring sessions, you know, the patients that come in to those sessions, I reckon there's a, a really high a high prevalence of BDD. And a lot of the time I didn't want to treat them, but then it's difficult because they've, you know, because I've got students to teach. I mean, do you find that in your, uh, do you do one-to-one -one mentoring sessions or, um, I mean, have you found that as well, something similar? Um, the, you mean that the patient who comes in for the session yeah. or, the, or the, the person you're training? Patients who the come in patient. for your training session. Um, let's, I mean, I, I think we probably get more of that in the clinic than in the, in the training school, I think. It's hard to say, but they, they're, they're often, my experience is that there's, there's, more, there's more emotion around, uh, there's more anxiety, there's more kind of, I want to get this right. There's more, they're more of a, it's more of a focused project for the people with, and they tend to book into the clinic rather than the training school. Um, uh, but yeah, you can spot them. For, for me, it's that, it's that, uh, the, the, it's the, if there's an element of self-loathing anywhere, that's a really big red flag. Mm. You know, I hate looking at myself in the mirror become that's instantly, you know, that's such a powerful emotion. I don't, I don't think I can solve it by removing a couple of wrinkles. Um, but I wouldn't dismiss it just on that. I need to find out what the, what the, what the underlying story is. Mm. Um, but if you find out a story that you that you can't solve, um, obviously there's no point injecting it. Well, this is a problem when uh, quite often when people come in for these training sessions because the treatments are so cheap. I mean, it's not uh, it's not marketed at a, a discounted price. It's just the, the training price, but it's still it's cheap and people come. And they come in, they're like, oh, doctor, I just want this, you know, and then they pull their whole, they, they, they're asking your facelift and they want everything done on their face, which you know is not, is not doable with injectables, um, which is also always a, a warning sign. And uh, I, I think that's part of the reason why I decided to come out of the mentoring, because it was just, sometimes I was having to treat people and I didn't feel comfortable with treating them just with injectables. A lot of them had really bad skin because they would use sun beds they would be sun worshippers and then you know that's why they've got all these static lines and and then they look older than they than they actually are and they think botox is the answer yeah there, there is a there is an issue with it's it's true across life when you try and it's just what i was saying about stress and kids when you're trying to meet two objectives simultaneously you get into there's always an overlap where it's not good um and for, for me, the training environment is that because you're trying to train people who may have come from all over the country and you're trying to treat someone um, and that you've got to meet both their objectives simultaneously. So there's a compromise there, um, which, which is something that I often address in the training environment. I'll say that this is only part of the advice that you might get in a, in a, in a different setting um, and that, you know, you should we're, we're actually thinking of ways of trying to build that into a different system that you do a proper consultation and then then have a plan that you could then go onto the training school to, to fulfill parts of. But it is an interesting insight, and I've, one I've felt the same way about. Um, but it happens throughout people's consultations. It happens if you're running late and you're trying to catch up and you've got a patient. Then you're trying to meet two aims simultaneously. You're trying to be fast and you're trying to solve your patient's yeah. problem and somewhere you're going to fail. Yeah. So uh, having one goal is a really good, good way of knowing that you're going to do good work. Do you believe that aesthetics medicine will ever become and become, become recognised as a specialty in its own right and will have some sort of a um, kind of a training or mentoring system similar to how we train doctors in the NHS, you know, the different levels, consultant, registrar, SHO, because really it's that kind of framework, that kind of the network would be so valuable. I mean, do you think that would ever be possible within aesthetics? Um, I actually think it's probably an inevitability, but I have no idea the time scale. Um, only because it's going to be more and more complex, and it eventually it's there's going to be a law that comes in and says you have to comply. And I think at the moment, with w as soon as that happens, you're going to have to. It's going to become a system that you have to buy into at a certain level and move up to, move up yeah. through. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the critical thing is at the moment that there's some legislation is passed, which is actually something that the JCCP want, obviously. Um, uh, I think even HEE asked for it, but they didn't, they didn't get it for some reason. They said it was too politically complex, so the government changed their mind on it. Mm. Um, 
but it, but if that happens, because I think there's a lot of will in all sorts of places for that to happen, mm. and if that happens, I think that will make it a specialty. I'm not saying it's a specialty that people necessarily will like. It may not be that doctors are at the top or surgeons or dermatologists are at the top. Um, it could be that you buy into it as a as any healthcare professional. I'm hoping that would be what it would be. Mm. Um, even the JCCP is not are not making it. Um, you, there's no way you could you could be respons- fully responsible for patients or actually responsible for patients without being a healthcare professional. Um, they will still be doing all the signatures on the prescriptions um, and doing all the treatments, not doing all the treatments as it stands. Um, but that's. But I think as soon as that happens, it's, it is becoming a specialty. But I don't know if it's going to be a copy of you know gynecology. It, it may not fit exactly the medical model, but uh, but I think it will. It'll shift it enormously yeah. in the right direction. And what are your views on training people who are non-prescribers, knowing that that's going to be a huge stumbling block for them? Well, it's been um, the whole prescribing thing has been a, you know, it, it's been an evolving thing. I, mean, I actually remember as a, as a junior doctor it being a bit contentious. Still, I remember consultants, and in a, you know, you know how they can be a little bit like it's dumbing down medicine, and now everyone's going to be worse off because of this. Um, so it was a relatively new thing, and even it, when we first started training, it wasn't it wasn't a very prevalent qualification. But it's certainly now becoming much more prevalent. Mm. Um, it's not. It, it is as it becomes more prevalent. There's going to be there will be a tipping point where it'll be almost no point because you won't be able to prescribe. You won't be able to find a prescriber because all the prescribers will be working for themselves. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, we we recommend that you find a prescriber before you join. We have a good network of of, of pre- prescribers as well. Um, but you, you, I think there's something around the mindset of that prescriber, basically being responsible for the treatment that need that would need a bit more shift, a bit more of a shift. Um, uh, so it's not ideal. I think it's doable. I think people have been practicing for years well, um, with a with a good relationship with a prescriber. Um, but yeah, I think it's inevitable that you should you should do that quite rapidly after if you wanted to go into aesthetics seriously, you should become a prescriber. Because um, I just recently found out that I think dental therapists and dental hygienists, even though they can learn, they can do the level seven uh, injectable qualification, they can't actually do the prescribing course at the moment. Yeah, I believe there's some movement around them to try and challenge that as well, yeah. which I imagine once prescribing becomes a bolt on for one thing, it's it's quite likely to possibly to spread because they are level five and six trained so they're, they're trained to d- degree standard so bolting on a, deg- uh, a quali- qualification like that mm. should be possible um, I think the other context with them is that they the idea is they're working under dentists that's kind of part of it but that obviously that doesn't actually happen all the time mm. uh, but that system works quite well if you're working in a practice with a dentist that that that's ideal because you've got all you've got everything set up yeah. and it, that feels like a good system to me um, but yeah, other other than that, it's similar to a non-prescribing nurse. Um, but yeah, things are changing, and it changes quite rapidly when it does. So I, I don't know whether that's going to come from the aesthetic side or just from the fact that they'll want to be able to prescribe in dentistry. I, I wouldn't have thought there's much, I, although I'm probably talking out of turn because I don't know exactly all the roles they do. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> I don't want to get it wrong. I have a, you know, We all have an idea of what professions do, and I've learned the hard way that they do a lot more than yeah. most of us think. Um, when you get talked to them. And roles are constantly changing, aren't they? Um, you know, what things that nurses are allowed to do, and, and, you know, there are some specialist nurses who know a lot more than the doctors work, you know, the junior doctors working that specialty. Um, in fact, when I was doing neurosurgery, neurointensive care in Southampton, this was quite a few years ago now, there was this technician who um, had specialist training in America to do to put in ICP bolts central lines and you know all this really invasive procedures and he he actually taught me how to do central lines and chest drains and you know if I ever need a procedure like that I would want him to do it rather than the junior doctor in the department yeah so and he's just a technician with no medical background but he's had the appropriate training and you know and, and he was sticking these probes into people's brains and he was doing much better than neurosurgeons so I think to to do any particular technique, anyone can be trained to do a te- to be a technician, and anyone can become good at a particular procedure. But the the downfall is that this technician he's never going to be able to diagnose. This, he's not going to be able to to know when a patient needs 
an ICP bolt put in. So if he has the instructions put that in, then he can do it perfectly. So I think that is, you know, if, if, I, if we sort of take that into aesthetics, I think anyone, probably anyone can learn how to inject Botox and fillers, but not everyone is going to understand um, the indications for those procedures. When is it right to, to do it and when it's inappropriate to do it and, and what are the alternatives? I think that is yeah. the key, isn't it? Well, I 100% agree. And it's something that we have to battle with on a day-to-day -day basis, almost with who we say. We say no to so many people with training and they often have incredibly formidable technical skills. Mm -hmm. But but that's one of the criteria I'm looking at is which it, it, have you actually gathered information, assimilated, weighed up the importance of each aspect of that bit of information and made a clinical decision that then allows you to deliver that technical skill or are you just delivering it off the back of someone else making a decision? Uh, and that and that I discovered recently is what a lot of qualifications, when you say something's level six, that's one of the skills that they're looking at is that you're you are gathering information and making, making decisions independently. Mm. Um, so level four, for example, you're not doing that. You're you're basically a technician at that level. Mm. So so there are ways of looking at that, but then then the relevance of each skill comes into it, which which is an, an ongoing debate. Um, but within aesthetics, I think you agree with me if it, about being a specialty that you you can't you can't necessarily say that your skills as a GP or as a um, as a dental therapist are the same are what you need mm. for aesthetics obviously they're not but maybe there's something in the algorithm decision making that is relevant um, in terms of weighing up the weighing up the importance of information avoiding risk um, making different decisions in very similar situations because of certain characteristics mm. if, if you're able to think that way possibly you could plug that's a that's a foundation skill and that's what they would be saying by saying if you can do got level six you can do level seven and mm. um, they're essentially saying that you can plug in your skills on top of these skills and you'll be a safe practitioner if you pass the exam um, but I 100% agree with that that difference which is that the technical versus the almost kind of uh, professional wisdom almost about about decision making I think it's a good point yeah and so for those people out there who are completely new to aesthetics or maybe have done a foundation day and, and haven't done much with it what advice do you have for them in terms of you know, if they're trying to choose between foundation day or level seven, or maybe they've done the foundation day, they're thinking, should I do a master class in something or should I do a level seven? What would you advise them? Um, that's really interesting. I mean, uh, le level seven is, is going to give you a certainty about the future beyond what any foundation or any training can do. You can do a 50 courses and you'll have less certainty about being in the industry than you will with a level seven because that's that's a proper qualification like if someone has rubber stamped you to say you can do the things that you say you can do um, whereas most courses even with failure rates um, they're not really qualified they're not qualifications it's just, it's just different so you'll get certainty um, I don't know I mean I don't think I would have done level seven if I if I wasn't certain about it ten years ago I would have I would have done something smaller mm. and then built on it um, but times are changing you know if you really want to go into it I I don't see it being unlikely that within it'll probably be four to five years time that it'll be the only way in and I think that'll massively change the the, the industry mm. because it's it's just a bigger cost even the cheapest versions are, are very expensive um, I think you should find out whether you really like aesthetics that's probably the most I mean it sounds almost trite but don't go into it because you hate your day job yeah I think it's um, really good it's, advice it's and it's such a um i mean i i hear people say it quite a lot like what less so i would say that most because i always ask this question on the beginning of a training day what what are your hopes and fears what are you hoping to get from today and most people it's much there's a lot of positives around why they're choosing it and some people it's because i'm just uh, but but it's more and more because i want to do something for myself you know i want to make people happy i want to all those sorts of things um uh, so I think there, there are a lot of people who do do it for positive reasons, but don't do it for negatives. Well, I actually said this earlier. Any any decision made in fear or because you don't, it doesn't tend to be good. Mm -hmm. you, you need to make a decision for a positive reason to build something positive yeah. that you want to you actually want to do, and you'll you'll probably be making a good just good decision then. And what about those people who have had years of experience, um, but perhaps don't want to spend loads of money on a level seven because they, they you know they've got the competencies through experience, but just not a qualification to say that they have that. I mean, are there any alternatives? 
Uh, well, you you don't have to do anything now because there's no law and public don't know about it, really. So you could carry on and then at the point where it becomes law, if you decide you want to join the JCCP, you, you get your qualification, you get your knowledge validated. It's going to be these, these assessment centers where you pay a much smaller fee. Yeah. You just do the exam. You don't do the whole qualification and hopefully you pass. Um, so you could do that. Yeah. I would say having done the level seven it's there's a lot of stuff that you that you don't need day to day and you can be very good that you that you actually will need to pass the level seven so there's more in there um than you'd think so i think everyone's gonna have to do some studying no matter how much experience you've got you're gonna have to pick up a book and do some reading yeah i mean I, i've actually signed up to the level seven like last january and i've not had time to really work on it very much and uh, because of previous experience um I, I got into the teaching side of things um but i i definitely don't regret signing up to it and i will i will complete it and i found that the, all the students coming through the level seven qualification they you know they found the mentoring part of it so useful um, a lot of the the knowledge may be just kind of quite academic and like you said you don't use it day to day but it is kind of for someone who's completely new to aesthetics is really good foundation um, to build on and the mentoring session is something that you know I wish I had when I first started because it was terrifying that the first patient that I injected with toxin you know I had to tell her to close her eyes because my hand was shaking you know and uh, I, st I still remember that um, and it and I had a previous experience in surgery and intensive care you know I was putting central lines into people and I wasn't shaky and, and but this a tiny needle injecting into someone's face for some reason was just terrifying so the mentoring is really helpful so um, I, I think just for that I would advise people to sign up to the level seven because that really helps build confidence yeah that, I mean that's actually a really interesting point which you don't you don't necessarily think of when you're making the choice which is Doing doing a day course might be quicker or cheaper and less commitment, but if you don't come out with the as much of a, a either a desire or a sense of safety to practice, that it may not save you anything. Mm. Um, and maybe that is one thing you get from level seven, which is that mentoring that's going to actually you will actually come out the other end of it feeling you we shouldn't have those same emotions if you've been injecting for it'll be ten more than ten times more I think mm. in in a supervised environment. So yeah, that's a good point. And actually, a lot of the students who are actually really good at injecting, but they just don't believe that they're good. Um, and I just it, all it takes is for me to say to them, look, you, you've done that really well. I'm happy for you to do that independently now. Like you should you should feel uh, conf the confidence in yourself. And, and that makes a huge difference because like if no one else has to told them that they would have just, um, you know, gone home and, and given up. <laughs> because they believe that they're not safe enough, that there's always something that else they can learn to become safer. So I think for that also, it's very useful for them to get that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Real confidence to, yeah. to, to move on, like an efficient, but that's what it is, it's validated, validating your skills. Yeah. Well, great, thank you so much for your time. I think I've taken enough of your time today, Tim. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd I like to add? Um, so, um, I, I, no, I mean, I was hoping to ask you some questions, but it is getting on quite, quite late. Maybe we can do that at a different time. Um, if you want to, if you want to be on the receiving end of some questions. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. I normally go to bed like at midnight or one. <laughs> so this is actually still quite early for me, but it's up to you. I'm, I'm happy to, to continue if you are, but I'm also happy to do it another time. If you feel that that would be better. Um, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to not do you justice and do it quickly because it because I don't have that long. Um, maybe, but I feel like it's been really interesting. It's been really fun talking to you. Um, you got really good questions and some really good in insights of your own. Maybe we should do a longer session um, some of the some of the time because I'm, I'm I won't I won't have that long before I, it's my wind down time and I, I'll I know I won't be finished in twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't we do a, another discussion? I think. We did tell, talk about some really interesting stuff. I think I've um, kind of treated it more like a, a discussion, you know, amongst peers. I think this this is something that we need to do more often, uh, just these kind of discussions amongst mm -hmm. peers, uh, because it just doesn't happen enough, really. I think it's been the thing I've really liked about this chat. It's been really, really open and candid from both of us. Um, and I feel like that's something the industry could do with, mm -hmm. you know, the 
the the you know the doctor in his white suit or whatever who's never made a mistake image um and uh, and has never been fearful and never been nervous i don't think it helps anyone really yeah. helps the guy in the white suit i suppose <laughs> but um but uh yeah i think this kind of conversation needs to be had and uh, i'd be really interested to hear wh- however you share it if it's in components run along like if people can comment and ask further questions you might see what they think and and what they share would be quite nice and maybe something else will come of that yeah i will i'll post this in the group and uh I think instead of keeping it in my sort of membership area, I'll just post it as a video in my Facebook group and then people can comment. And I think it will be quite good to to get people's comments and, and see what they think as well. I feel a lot of people in the group are just silent readers. They, they don't contribute and and they think they're a bit fearful of saying the wrong thing and then having someone, you know, all these people just jumping on their backs and attacking them, which happens a lot. Um, it, you know, it's difficult to police it sometimes. Yeah, it is. Well, we we have our own group, which is which we're that's the main thing we that I get across to everyone is that this this needs to if this isn't a safe place to contribute, then it's nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you've got to make that your number one. Um, but you're so right about the number of lurkers who don't feel confident. I know because I often get messaged about you know in the in behind the scenes, particularly if it's a, if it's a hot conversation, which you may have seen a few. <laughs> um, you get a lot of messages up behind the scenes that are not part of not part of that group. So. Um, it, it's it's interesting because you would think there's like five ten people involved and there's not there are more people who are watching learning and I would say that to anyone who's in this is if you just try your best to set an example and respond as if you're responding to everyone not just the one person on the thread and I think everyone would, would be better behaved in that in that way yeah definitely definitely all right I think we better end it here today so that we can both get some sleep and uh, okay. we'll have to arrange another time for another chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much. I'll just say it one more time. I, I, I love your ethos. I love, your, I love what you're trying to do. I think we're really aligned with, um, uh, with, with the contribution that you, we want to make. So I'm sure we'll have lots more to do with each other in the future. We'll thank you very much. Well, we, I think we need more people who are trying to do, achieve the same thing. And we need to work on it together because it, it takes so much more than one person or two people you know we need a whole team of us all working in unity um, in order to to make a change and I believe we can and I think we are slowly changing um the it's about changing people's attitudes um, and I think we'll do yeah. that we'll get there so yeah Absolutely. definitely and and just by but your group just by seeing you do this you'll be giving them permission to do the same thing and and, and I think it's contagious so I think it's a really good thing yeah I mean you you absolutely you you as well with your groups so um, we'll just keep going and one day it will happen okay thank you Chan thank you Tim I'll speak to you soon okay good night good night bye, bye.